Every American has two hometowns, his own and Washington. The nation's capital is a reminder of the history we share in common and the men whose dreams made a great nation. Jefferson, who once wrote modestly that two small stones were all he wanted for a monument. The Washington Monument, the city's towering landmark, tallest piece of masonry in the world. The Lincoln Memorial, its graceful columns representing the states of the Union. In front of the National Archives building, there's a statue symbolizing guardianship. It's an appropriate statue for the building houses and protects our most precious documents. By day, they're on display, encased in heavy frames and preserved by helium gas. And at night, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution move down into a fireproof and bombproof resting place. Washington has more to offer the sightseer than a short course in American history. The capital city is also noted for its museums and its collections of art. Visitors to the National Gallery come first into the great central rotunda, a hundred feet wide and a hundred feet high. The rotunda and the galleries leading from it provide an impressive setting for many of the world's finest paintings and sculptures. In Arlington, separated from Washington by the Potomac River, but bound to the city by tradition, is the tomb of the unknown soldier, one of the most revered of our national shrines. Washington keeps its tourists busy, shuttling from history to culture and, of course, to politics. Let's take a peek behind, or better yet, beneath the political scene. Here is the world's most exclusive subway, reserved for senators and their guests. It starts out from underneath the Senate office building. After a perilous trip of several hundred yards, it reaches its destination, the Capitol building. The Capitol symbol of government, traditional and magnificent backdrop for the inauguration of presidents. The Capitol, meeting place of Congress since 1800. Near the Capitol is the center of the judicial branch of government, the Supreme Court. In front, a statue eternally contemplates justice. And inside, nine men dispense it. Justice is also the concern of another federal department. Lawyers know it as the government's legal agency. But to most of us, it signifies the G-men and their legendary boss, J. Edgar Hoover. The Treasury Department, where those lovely government checks come from. And here's the birthplace of the folding stuff, the biggest money-making plant in the world. Of course, these are only dollar bills. But a dollar here, a dollar there, it adds up. The modern new headquarters of the State Department, testifying to the importance of foreign affairs in this shrinking world of ours. And finally, the historic White House. George Washington laid its cornerstone in 1792, and since then, it has witnessed the coming and going of every president. And on January 20th, 1953, it's moving day again at the White House as General Dwight D. Eisenhower arrives to take over the presidency from Harry S. Truman. In keeping with tradition, the incoming and outgoing chief executives ride together to the Capitol where the inaugural ceremony is to take place.
A huge crowd of 150,000 is assembled in the Capitol Plaza, straining for a glimpse of one of democracy's recurring great moments, the simple ceremony by which power is peacefully transferred from the hands of one man to those of another. Eisenhower will be sworn in by Chief Justice Fred Vinson. But first, Senator Nolan administers the oath of office to Richard Nixon. In seven years, the young Californian has risen from freshman representative to vice president. You, Dwight D. Eisenhower, do solemnly swear. I, Dwight D. Eisenhower, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States, that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States, and will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. In a spontaneous gesture, Ike moves to share his triumph with Mamie. Then, with the world listening to his words, he winds up his inaugural address. The peace we seek, then, is nothing less than the practice and the fulfillment of our whole faith among ourselves and in our dealings with others. It signifies more than the stilling of guns, easing the sorrow of war. More than an escape from death, it is a way of life. More than a haven for the weary, it is a hope for the brave. This is the hope that beckons us onward in this century of trial. This is the work that awaits us all, to be done with bravery, with charity, and with prayer to Almighty God. My citizens, I thank you. At the head of a 10-mile long inaugural parade, the President and First Lady head for the White House. Despite Eisenhower's wish for a simple inauguration, this one has mushroomed into the biggest ever seen in the capital city. Not only is it a tribute to the vast personal popularity of a man called Ike, but it also marks the beginning of a Republican administration after 20 unbroken years of Democratic rule. A hundred sergeants, all veterans of Korea, make up Ike's guard of honor. From the reviewing stand in front of the White House, the president and vice president watch the parade go by. 25,000 marchers pay their respect in this long moment of celebration before the exacting task begins of guiding our nation through a critical four years. 